Uh, if you would open your registration panels uh, to, it, to the registration panel in your bulletin, there's a couple of announcements there for you this morning. Uh, if you would like to join in for the handbell ensemble or the traditional choir, uh, they are starting up on August 14th. Uh, and if you'd like more information, uh, you can talk to Renessa, and I'm sure that she will fill you in on anything you need. August 10th is the Memorial Golf Tournament. It's a great time to sign up and come play and have some fellowship together and a chance for me to win a golf tournament. Uh, so I'm excited about that. Y'all, I've talked so much junk about this golf tournament, I'm not going to play any good. Uh, it's going to be fun. It's, it's about having fun, though. Congratulations to our Memorial Scholarship recipients, Hannah Bailey, Sarah Catherine Lee, and Carson Radline. If you open up your bulletin, you will see some more announcements uh, as part of our five practices. Wonderful Wednesdays with Miss Katie are going on this summer. There's information there about those. Promotion Sunday is coming up on August 18th. Uh, so if you have a third grader or a sixth grader, if you will please make sure uh, that Katie Jeter knows and has their contact information so that she can make sure that they are part of that. The youth will have their car wash fundraiser that was delayed from last week. It will be this coming Saturday, June 20th here at the church. Uh, we invite you to come by and uh, also they're all bring off raffling off a Yeti roadie cooler. Um, so if you would like a Yeti roadie, uh, I encourage you to come by. Uh, they will raffle it off. Uh, take your car out in the mud, get some mud on it this week. Uh, bring it by and let the youth wash it for you. Uh, if you bring mud, don't bring it to me if I'm there that day. Just take it to the youth. They're much better at that than I am. <laughs> also, Operation Christmas Child is our Christmas in July. There are baskets in the back if you'd like to donate items. You can donate money to help offset the cost of shipping, or you can fill a box, whatever uh, you want to do. We would encourage you to do that as part of our Christmas in July for Operation Christmas Child. This morning we are opening with a hymn, hymn number 92, For the Beauty of the Earth. I would encourage you to stand and sing together.
you now to join us as we affirm what it is we believe with the words of the Apostles Creed as printed on page 881 in your hymnals. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. First scripture lesson is Luke chapter 10 verses uh, verses 25 through 37 is the parable of the Good Samaritan it starts on page 1612 on one occasion an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus teacher he asked what must I do to inherit eternal life what is written in the law he replied how do you read it he answered love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring in oil or wine. Then he put, on the man, put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
I invite you to join me in prayer. God, we give you thanks for a moment of silence, a moment to quiet our minds and our hearts. A moment to listen. So many times, Lord, we are concerned with words to say, things to bring before you. And we forget to listen, to find the quiet in life. God, this morning we give you thanks for all who are gathered here who are here with us, sitting next to us, and who are here with us in spirit. We come to you this morning with open hearts to hear your word, to offer ourselves. Lord, may this morning be about offering ourselves and worshiping you more than it is what we can get out of the service. Lord, you have given us everything we need. May we be willing to give ourselves to you. The source of our hope, our healing, our grace, our peace, and our love. And we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the glory forever. Amen. We now invite our ushers to come forward to receive our offering. We invite you, you are welcome to place your offering in the plate or to give it electronically. There are instructions in your bulletin how to do that. We know that not everybody is ready to give, but when you are, we will joyfully and gratefully receive it.
Please be seated. Scripture reading this morning comes from Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Hear the word of God. From Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. We've done this since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all God's people. You have this faith and love because of the hope reserved for you in heaven. You previously heard about this hope through the true message, the good news, which has come to you. This message has been bearing fruit and growing among you since the day you heard and truly understood God's grace. In the same way that it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, you learned it from Ephorus, who is the fellow slave we love in Christ's faithful minister for your sake. He informed us of your love in the Spirit. Because of this, since the day we heard about you, we haven't stopped praying for you and asking for you to be filled with the knowledge of God's will, with all wisdom and spiritual understanding. We're praying this so that you can live lives that are worthy of the Lord and pleasing to him in every way, by producing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God, by being strengthened through his glorious might, so that you endure everything and have patience, and by giving thanks with joy to the Father, he made it so you could take part in the inheritance and light granted to God's holy people. He rescued us from the control of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. He set us free through the Son and forgave our sins. The Word of God for the people of God. So you learn when you become a preacher, there's one thing that you become that's not necessarily in the job description. Nobody really kind of talks about it. It's just an assumed thing. You, anywhere you go, are the designated prayer. If you are in a meeting, if you are at a meal with family, if you are just sitting around a table and somebody says, we need to pray, they look at you and go, preacher, would you pray? What am I going to say? No. It's not really an option. Do you gladfully and joyfully pray? I remember my brother had a barbecue for his whole neighborhood. They cooked a whole hog. We had been out there for hours just hanging out. And my brother stands up and he does it. He goes, I'm going to do a welcome. And I was like, you do it. And he says, I want to welcome everybody. Thank you all for coming today. My brother, the preacher, is going to pray now. (laughs) Yes, I am. Now, we're always happy to pray, but sometimes I really like it when other people pray. But the most often thing that people, people will come up to me and say, Preacher, I will do whatever you need me to do in the church. Just don't ask me to pray in public. I will do anything, and I'm like, really, anything. I got a list. Just don't make me pray in public. And I think it's because we get anxious about praying in public. That we're not going to do it the right way. I remember one of the first times that I went on a pastoral visit. I was still a youth director. And one of the youth was having a surgery in Charleston. So I was in Aiken. Got up early in the morning. Drove all the way to Charleston. Spent a couple hours with the family and the youth before. Waited for the doctor to come in. And this whole time I've been sitting in the back of my mind thinking, okay... What do I need to pray for? I've been listening to this family. I need to, you know, this whole thing in my head. And the doctor comes in and he greets and he's about to walk in. And he goes, can I pray with y'all before I go? And I said, yes, you can. (laughs) And he starts, dear heavenly Lord, we give thou thanks for all thy great works that thou hast done. And continues on this great King James language prayer. And I'm like, Wow, that is beautiful. That is so much better than anything I had thought of in my head. I can't pray the King James prayer. I don't have that language. 
But I think there are people that we have to use, think we have to use that kind of language or a certain language. Then there's the prayer where we kind of give thanks, but not really. God, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that I am a Clemson fan and I am not like my Gamecock brothers and sisters. <laughs> Lord, I, I give thanks to you that you have given me this Ford truck to drive and did not strand me with a Chevy. I got an amen in the first service, by the way. <laughs> Lord, I give you thanks that I am here at church on this Sunday morning and I am not like the sinners who are not here with me. That one hits a little closer to home. How do we pray? I used to do my prayers at bedtime. I would lay in bed. God, I give you thanks for this day, for my family, for... I'd wake up the next morning, amen. Prayed eight hours. I don't know why prayer kind of gets people anxious. It's a conversation. It is nothing more than a conversation and at the same time it is much more than a conversation. You see, prayer isn't just something that we do inside of our heads. Most of us, when we pray, it's praying with our thoughts. Very few of us will actually speak out words when we pray, I notice. But I want to I think about prayer as something more than just words. There's an author, Eusto Gonzalez. He's a United Methodist pastor. He married a Presbyterian pastor. And he said, I was going into surgery a couple of years ago, and I realized what the difference between my United Methodist friends and my Presbyterian friends was. He said, my United Methodist friends told me, I will pray for you. And my Presbyterian friends told me, I will think about you. It's interesting. I will think about you. Doesn't mean that they're not going to pray for you, but you're going to be in their thoughts. My hope is that the United Methodist friends meant that when I pray for you, I might actually use some words or live out a life. Maybe my prayer for you is in the form not just of words, but maybe my prayer is to actually come see you in the hospital. Maybe my prayer is that when you get home, I bring you a meal as a form of prayer. You see, prayer is not just words. Henry Nouwen says in his book, The Way of the Heart, that while prayer and prayer making is important in what we say and what we think, that we should get back to a Jewish understanding of prayer that is from the heart. And the heart is the source of all physical, emotion, emotional, intellectual, and moral energies. Let me say that again. We should get back to prayer of the heart. And the heart is the source of all physical, emotional, intellectual, and moral energies. So if the prayer is coming from our heart where everything that we have and our physical, emotional, and intellectual comes from there, prayer becomes more than just words. Prayer becomes a life living out. That's why Paul can write that we have prayed for you without ceasing. It's not that Paul got some buddies and was like, okay, I got this hour, you got this hour, you got this hour, we'll sleep in between and we'll just pray the whole time. It became a way of life for them. Prayer was more than just words. Prayer was the way that they lived their life. It was a life that they lifted to God. In his intro to letters, Paul usually kind of lays out things for us. And we're going to spend the next four weeks in Colossians. And so Paul's laying out, and it's great because Paul does a favor for us. Paul kind of tells us that they've been praying and about the great faith of the people at Colossae. And then he has this transition phrase. Always look for transition phrases when you're reading, by the way. Words, so that, because. 
those kind of words. He starts, because of this. So you know he's about to hit something good. Because of all that I have said, because of all of your faith, because of all these prayers, since the day we heard about you, we haven't stopped praying for you and asking for you to be filled with the knowledge of God's will, with all wisdom and spiritual understanding. We're praying this so that you can live lives that are worthy of the Lord and pleasing to him in every way by producing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. Because of this, we want you to live out a life. We want your life to be more than words, more than head knowledge. I went to a Lutheran seminary and and there was a conversation one day about at what age should we serve children communion. My Lutheran friend said, well, when children get to the point that they understand, you know, really get what communion is about, is when we should serve them communion. I looked at them, I said, do you really get what communion is about? They said, yeah, I, I get it, I get it. I said, can you give it to me in a couple sentences? Well, no, no. But I did write a 10 page paper on it last week. So let me tell you what, there's nobody in your congregation probably that's going to come up to you and say, can I read your 10-page paper on theology theology of communion? I said, but there will be a little kid who comes up to you and says, that looks good. Can I have some of that? If you noticed last week, I changed the bread on y'all, if you were here last week. I changed to homemade bread. I've been doing homemade bread either myself or people in my church for a while. Because my belief is that if we're going to give out communion, it should be the good stuff. Homemade bread and Welch's grape juice. Listen, Welch was a Methodist. Don't kid yourselves. The good stuff. My girls on Sunday morning are like, Daddy, are we having communion this week? No, sweetheart, I'm sorry. Which I think is the opposite sometimes of how we are. Oh, it's communion this week. We're getting out 15 minutes late. Baptist's going to beat us to the buffet. Left a roast in the oven. Going to have to run home and check on that. Can't stay for that last hymn today. It's the good stuff. I give it to any child who wants it and I say, this is because God loves you. And if all they get is that I get the good stuff because God loves me, I will take that every day. I get the good stuff because God loves me. Maybe I can grow up a generation of people who like communion. Who walk in the door and are like, yes, it's communion day. I don't care if the Baptist beat me to the buffet. Think about Moses. Moses standing at the Reed Sea. God parts the waters. Thank goodness Moses was not Methodist. Because if he was, he'd have said, look, the waters are parted. We're going to need a committee to study this for the next year and figure out, should we really cross? I mean, are, are, are are the walls of water, are they really structurally sound? We need an engineer to get in here and and measure and and figure it all out. No. The sea parted. I walk across. I may not understand how God parted the sea. I may not understand why there's an Egyptian army behind me. I may not understand how me crossing the sea is going to take care of the Egyptian army. But there is a way right here and I am going. I'm not going to stand there and wait to try to figure it all out. I'm just going to go. That's what God called me to do, to go. I don't need to fully understand why. Wesley learned this. Wesley was struggling with his faith a little bit. Something that you and I do. Sometimes it's 
we get up on Sunday morning and it's not the easiest thing to get to church it's not the easiest thing to read scripture or pray every day we struggle sometimes Wesley was struggling he went to his friend Peter Bowler and he said I'm not really sure what I should do maybe I should just stop preaching for a little while until I get my faith back until it's where it should be and Bowler said some of my favorite words to Wesley he said preach faith till you have it and then because you have it you will preach faith let me read that again preach faith until you have it and then because you have it you will preach faith let me make that simple for us do what God is calling you to do you don't have to understand all the reasons why or the hows but just do it and sometimes you're gonna mess up you're gonna make mistakes I remember when I was a little kid, when I was about five years old, my dad got me my first set of golf clubs. They were the little plastic golf clubs with a little plastic ball that you could hit around the yard. And I'd hit that thing for hours in the front yard. And I got to the point I could hit it almost all the way across the yard and I thought I was the greatest thing in the world. And then dad gave me real clubs and I learned that, well, that's a different story than the little plastic ones. And so then I had to go relearn. And all I really just want, just let me hit the ball. And I finally hit the ball enough that I figured out how to do it. When I was a kid, when we were growing up, when I was, you know, eight, nine years old, we lived on a golf course. I'd get up in the morning, we'd go play nine holes, we'd go to the range when we were done, we'd go swim for the rest of the day, and about four or five in the afternoon, we would go play another nine holes. I pray now that I just have like a half of the energy that I used to have back then. But we practiced and we got better. I'm not the fastest reader in the world. I don't necessarily love to read. I kind of force myself to read sometimes. But my wife loves reading. I'm surprised that her Kindle has not like blown up yet uh, because she's on it like all the time. She has a spare moment. Her favorite thing is to just read. She loves reading. And so I specifically remember when we were engaged one afternoon, the new Harry Potter book came out. It was the last Harry Potter book, Deathly Hollows, the one that's like that thick. So she got it at like 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and she was so excited, and she sat down and started reading. Next thing I know, it's like 9 or 10 o'clock at night, and she's like, I'm done. I said, excuse me? She said, I'm done. I said, you read the whole thing? She goes, Yeah. I was like, well, I want to read it. Like a month later, I'm done. It took me almost as many weeks as it took her hours to read. But she reads all the time. She's gotten good at it. There's a prayer shawl ministry in my home church. My mom kind of wanted to pick it up and be a part of it. She had to learn to crochet. And I've already apologized to my mom at the 9 o'clock service, so I'm apologize now because I've realized I can't tell as many stories on them because it's all online. And it's videoed, so I'm sorry, Mom. Mom was not good when she picked up the crochet, and I'm just going to tell you. She made a scarf. It was about that long. Real tight-knit. She did her first, like, crochet blanket. The sides kind of did this number. And she looked at me and she goes, they're a little, they're not quite straight, are they? I was like, nope, not quite there, mama. But she kept working at it. And you know what? She got better. She could whip those things out and they look beautiful. But that first couple of times, it wasn't great. You see, Christ is calling us not to be perfect not to have it all figured out. When we start trying to do the things that Christ calls us to do, we don't have to have it all figured out. And even if we do have it all figured out, we're still going to mess up. 
You are not perfect. I am not perfect. My staff has probably hung out with me enough to tell you I'm not perfect. But here's the thing. We still go forward. I am never afraid to fail at something. But if I'm going to do something, I'm going to go all in. I remember I loved playing football when I was a little kid. I wasn't very good. I was slow, but I always wanted to play wide receiver because I wanted the ball. They never let me play quarterback. So I was like, give me the ball. I want to play wide receiver. And I remember we were playing on the playground at school, and I went out for a pass, and I'm running a route, and I noticed that there's nobody around me. Quarterback throws the ball to me. I catch it. I'm excited. I'm like right there in the end zone, and I turn, and about two feet in front of me is a pine tree. I ran face first right into that sucker. I had a big old knot on my forehead. You, you ever seen the, the episodes where somebody like runs into something and they fall flat? That was me. I did that. But I held on to the ball. Don't kid yourself. We still scored a touchdown. That's the important part of the story. But the really important part is I learned a couple of things. One. Don't play football around pine trees. Two, if you do, know where the pine trees are. Next day, big old knot on my head, guess what? I was out playing football again. I am never afraid to fail. I don't like failing. I don't like when things go right. But I don't want to let that fear hold me back. So that's how I'm going to be with the church. If we're going to do something, we're going full force. We're going all out. And if it doesn't work out, guess what? We learned what not to do, so next time we don't do that again. But I'm never afraid for us to be all in for what we believe God is calling us to. And we're going to stumble along the way, and that's okay. Okay. Because God has released us. As it tells us in the scripture today, he has released us from all the things that can trip us up and keep us down. He has given us everything we need. He has transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves. He set us free through the son and forgave our sins. What more do we need? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to stand with me now for our closing hymn. Hymn number 77, How Great Thou Art. Let us stand and sing together.
receive the benediction. Let us go forth from this place doing what Christ has called us to do, knowing that when we stumble, Christ will pick us up. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen.